Uh, so hello, my name is Tavis Ormandy. Uh, this is Julian Tinez. We're, um, we're information security engineers at, on the Google security team. And uh, yeah, our talk is called There's a Party at Ring Zero. And, and you're invited. <laughs> so all systems make assumptions about kernel security. And in fact, um, in the entire security model of some systems can be based on um, the security boundary provided by the kernel. Um, Things like sandboxing in, in uh, Google Chrome uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Android make, make Google, uh, in particular, in particular uh, dependent on kernel security. Um, and of course, this is true for lots of other applications uh, on other platforms. So we've been involved in finding, fixing, and mitigating some really interesting kernel bugs over the last year. And, uh, and we're going to share some of our work today. Uh, so we're going to discuss some of the ways that, uh, uh, that you can protect uh, the kernel for malicious user land code and mitigate unknown kernel vulnerabilities that uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the kernel itself. So um, the first section of our talk is called the kernel as a target. So imagine you have arbitrary code execution on a machine. And if you want to escalate or just merely switch your privileges because it's not necessarily an escalation, you might want to um, get the privileges of just another user. Uh, what can you target? You can target, in general, processes with more or different privileges. So for instance, running daemons, statuid binaries, you can execute on Unix. And you can also target the kernel. And the kernel has a lot of um, nice properties uh, for you as an attacker. For instance, it has a huge code, code base. It performs a lot of complex and error-prone tasks. And it's responsible for the whole security model of the system. So it's really a primary target for you. Um, the Linux kernel has, has been a local target for over a decade. We've seen, um, we've seen many different kinds of bugs. We've seen memory and memory management corruption type of bug, which is um, yeah, the first type of bug uh, versus logic bugs. And the complexity of a kernel makes for more diverse and interesting logic bugs than than in user land, usually. Um, we've, we've listed here a few logic bugs that we really liked. Um, in particular, the first one, I think, is, um, is a really good example of, of things going wrong. So uh, if, you want, if you want to take a look at this, they are really interesting. Um, and we've seen, we've seen also memory management corruption bugs. And they, they also tend to be more interesting and diverse than their user land counterpart, where it's almost always the same. Uh, it, this is due to, first, the complexity of the memory management, because, of course, the, the, the kernel is handling the whole memory management. And it's also due uh, to an interesting different paradigm where the attacker actually finally controls a full address space. So this, this, this allows an attacker to make way more complex attacks because he had the control of a whole address space to, um, to final, finally exploit any, any bugs he might find. Um, on the other hand, in user land, usually if you're trying to exploit a bug remotely, uh, trying, trying to get control over the address, address space by, by, by itself is already something, some, something quite hard. And um, that's why you see things such as heap spraying and um, all those things, they are, they are just giving you some control over the address space. Um, in this paradigm, you have full control. So we've also listed a few bugs that we won't detail today um, that you can, uh, at which you can look um, if you're interested. Uh, we will just mention today uh, the null or two, two user land pointer references. We will mention two of those today and give them as example. So um, escapes through the kernel. And exploiting the kernel is often the easiest way out of basically all kind of sandboxing techniques. Um, so old school ones such as chroot gels, which have been used forever, uh, mandatory access control, which, is, which has been gaining traction in um, Linux for the last 10 years, but is still not really widely used, uh, container style segregation such as vServer, and I'm only talking about Linux right now, but uh, on Windows you see you see the same uh, the same thing happening. Uh, using those for segregation, you still mostly export the full kernel attack surface, which is also why uh, virtualization 
is a popular alternative because it gives you a very, um, a very different security. Because you have, as an attacker, you would have to attack the virtualization layer um, instead of just having to attack a kernel to, to get out of a stateful jail or any traditional sandbox. And things such as mandatory access control, for instance, SE Linux, they make more sense if you have a full, uh, fully featured security patch, such as GR security, that also tries to protect the kernel. In Windows, uh, the situation has been different, but um, it's getting more and more the same. Traditionally, local kernel bugs were not considered really relevant and important on Windows. It has changed somewhat recently, uh, especially since the introduction of uh, Windows Vista. And we, we can see an increased reliance on domain control, the use of uh, network services, and um, features such as protected mode and integrity levels have been introduced with Windows Vista. So this has changed in the last few years and um, now Windows is roughly in the same situation as Linux now and people uh, care more and more about uh, local privilege escalation on this platform. Um, so it's still, it's a bit of the same. There's still no real big complex mandatory access control system on Windows but that's, yeah, that's the biggest dif um, difference now. In terms of remotely exploitable bug, bugs, um, on Linux, they have been quite rare. We have seen a few nat notable exceptions um, around 2004, 2005, when when Wi-Fi was was getting more and more used and was getting into the Linux kernels. We've seen a few remote exploits uh, by different people, um, but otherwise there is this rare exception: um, uh, SG uh, RACU uh, SCTP exploit, which has been released, um, I think, two years ago. Um, he has written a really interesting article in FRAC if you want to check this out with Twiz um, and a few others, but it's, it's not very common. On Windows, it ha um, they have been quite popular for yeah, at least six, seven years. Um, I think actually Barnaby Jack, who gave a talk yesterday, gave a talk in 2005 on, um, on some um, remote kernel bugs on Windows and um, usually the the, the target was not Microsoft code itself, but mostly um, third-party naive code in antivirus and uh, personal firewall. Um, you've seen also a few, a few GDI-related bugs, a very few TCP IP stack-related ones. Uh, our colleague Neil Meta and others have, have found one quite recently. Also, you've maybe noticed this um, uh, SMB v2 exploit by immunity last year, which um, generated some um, some buzz and uh, was quite impressive. Um, so those were nice remote kernel bugs. Uh, but the web browser are really what are changing the game now because surprisingly they do expose kernel attack surface remotely. For instance, through GDI and um, it's, it's, it's something that we've also seen on Linux. For instance, th there, there has been a remotely exploitable bug in NVIDIA drivers that you could actually exploit through a web browser. And, and the reason for that, and Tavis will talk a little bit more about it later, is that we have, we have tons of new features coming to the browser such as, such as web font, web GL, and so this exposed a lot of kernel attack surface remotely. Uh, so we will now present uh, some of the bugs we found uh, this past year. Uh, so we were working on kernel security for, for um, about a year. Um, and over that time we've, we've published uh, lots of bugs and we've, uh, we've still got some that are unpatched. Um, we're still waiting for, uh, for uh, fixes for some of these, but yeah, we found quite a few over the course of this, uh, over the course of this year. <laughs> so um, there were many entry points for, for an attacker to reach kernel attack surface. Uh, the obvious ones are system calls, but there's also things like octals, um, uh, kernel, anything that the kernel passes. Uh, file systems weren't uh, traditionally considered part of the kernel attack surface, but with, uh, in, recent, uh, in recent years with things like auto mounter, it's, uh, it's a legitimate way to attack the kernel. Um, obviously there's things like network protocols which are extremely attractive to attackers. Uh, and uh, primarily on Windows you have things like fonts um, uh, and other formats that, uh, that are handled in kernel. Um, of course, there's been lots of issues with executable formats, which are quite complex object, object formats. Uh, on Windows and Linux, there's been famous bugs in, in, uh, in COF, ELF, ADOT OUT, and so on. 
Um, uh, but one uh, underappreciated entry point that we, uh, we considered were DPL3 interrupt handlers. Uh, so we decided that, uh, that we should take a look at this stuff. So uh, we found one interesting issue uh, on Windows 2003. Uh, so Microsoft introduced a new DPL3 uh, uh, IDT entry. Uh, DPL3 just means accessible to Win3 code. Um, uh, so in the public symbols, Microsoft called this KI raise assertion. Um, it, if you, this basically makes, if you, uh, if you execute in 2C, it makes it, it makes it roughly equivalent to just raise exception status assertion failed. Um, so this is kind of odd. I've, I've, I've looked at lots of Microsoft code and I've never seen them use this feature. Um, and in fact, looking at the, the implementation in the kernel, it turns out that they made an interesting error. Um, they dispatched the interrupt uh, before enabling, um, they dispatched the, the, uh, the exception before enabling interrupt. So, uh, this bug, um, while not particularly high impact, it had, to, it had two interesting characteristics. Uh, the exploit, you simply just invalidate the ESP uh, and then call it in2c, so you could exploit it in just four bytes. And, uh, and the patch was interesting as well, simply because it, they, uh, just, they had to just re-enable the interrupt flag, so that's just one byte instruction, STI. So I'm, it's not particularly high impact, but we thought it was fun because of this, and I actually have a video of, it, uh, of, uh, of this happening. Uh, Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm just using CDB to open a uh, uh, an executable tool so that I can patch some code into it. Uh, so yeah, I just choose any random executable uh, so that I can use uh, the uh, the assemble function from from uh, the, the Windows debuggers. So yeah, just invalidate ESP. Uh, call in two C to raise the exception. Uh, uh, detach from the process, and yeah, you see, soft dice detects the fault, and uh, it breaks due to failure. If I turn off faults and then let it continue, you get a bug check. So <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of a funny bug. It's uh, but this one wasn't particularly high impact, but it was just interesting, uh, and shows that really there isn't much uh, exploration from researchers in this area. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, on on the subject of uh, of exceptions and interrupt handlers. Uh, a recap of how page faults work. So, as I'm sure everyone knows, a page fault occurs when uh, when there's some attempt to access a non-present page. Uh, but it's also if you have insufficient access to to, uh, to touch a, a present page, and there's various other uh, low-level paging-related errors. Um, so, when a page fault occurs, the the page fault uh, the uh, the handler for page faults is passed an exception code, which has a number of flags that describe what happened when the page fault occurred. Uh, so the flags are ID, which, is, which explains whether it was, was the page fault was caused by an instruction or data fetch. Uh, US, which means uh, the page fault occurred uh, when uh, during u uh, user or supervisor mode. Uh, WR, which says whether it was a read or write. And P or NP, which means present or not present. So, um, so supervisor mode, which is what sets the US bit, is, um, uh, is set when um, the page fault occurred during some privileged operation. Um, so if the supervisor bit is set, it can mean uh, various things. It could mean that a, bug, um, a kernel bug was encountered, and then you'd expect to see an oops or a bug check uh, on Linux or a bug check on uh, Windows, or some other kind of panic. Um, but it can also mean some other unusual low-level event happened. Um, in, and uh, you'd expect it would be normal for that to occur during something like a copy from user operation. Uh, but in most other circumstances, it would mean something unusual happened. Um, so, uh, by looking at this code, we, we, uh, we realized that if the processor can be tricked into setting these flags incorrectly, um, then you can confuse a lot of really privileged core operating system code. And uh, so, we were thinking about this for a while. And uh, we came up with a way to do this. Uh, so, uh, what we did was study the machine state of, uh, uh, while executing a virtual 8086 mode task in VMware, uh, in a VMware guest. Um, and we actually found a way to make VMware set the supervisor bit for an unprivileged page fault. Um, so the problem was, if you do a far call in virtual 8286 mode, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, it was emulated incorrectly. Uh, so obviously when you get a far call, you'd expect that the, uh, uh, the CS and IP pair to be pushed onto the stack. Uh, and this is actually done with supervisor access. It's, it's